we are live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are live okay thank you so much uh, hello everyone i am dr ankita ahuja i am a musculoskeletal radiologist and i am a part of innovision imaging and nm medical today we would be going through some cases just to revise the entire spectrum what we have seen till now so i have opened quite a few cases here and let's go through those cases uh, one by one so starting with one case and i'll even show you how i approach although you have seen the other two radiologists that is dr adit and dr malini's approach already uh, which would be definitely on the same lines as we are part of the same team uh, so uh, but let's go through each case in that same pattern so that we get used to how we approach a case as well so this is our first case <clears throat> how would i approach it so i always start seeing any case with a fat suppressed sequence so this is my fat suppressed coronal sequence i start scrolling through this so i'll come from one end i know i'm in the anterior most section why because i can identify the coracoid process over here then i keep on scrolling back what am i looking at when i'm scrolling back is looking for any marrow edema or any soft tissue edema which catches my eye so right now i'm predominantly looking for any soft tissue edema or bony edema and here i see some edema but with some cystic changes so i'll come back to it uh, i see something there then i keep on scrolling back and as i am scrolling back and forth i do not see uh, any other area of any specific marrow edema so this is the first thing which i have scrolled across on the fat suppressed image and figured out after this what i am going to do is next step is to look at the rotator cuff tendon so what are the rotator cuff tendon supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minor and subscapularis so i am going to look at those so how do i approach so i make my window in two sections i look on the coronal image and simultaneously i'll try and look on the sagittal image but first and foremost i'll start with my coronal image so i'll come to the anterior section how do i know that i am anterior again i have the coracoid process on this software we do not get lines uh, to annotate but otherwise you could correlate if you are using a software then this is your biceps tendon pulley area and the intraarticular segment beginning so i know a section behind this will start my supraspinatus so this is supraspinatus which has started which looks or which shows some increased signal so i'll also see it simultaneously on my coronal pd okay there is some increase signal over there there is significant increase signal there is this all increase signal and now if you look carefully over here you see some fluid signal as well so uh, <clears throat> so this is increase signal in the tendon along with some fluid signal in the bursal sided fibers i keep on scrolling back you still see some fluid signal over here and increase signal definitely within the tendon so there is quite a bit of increase signal within the tendon and that's how i'm going back so i still see increase signal and similarly i keep on going back so this is how i'm trying to see my supraspinatus i'll show the same things on and then we'll conclude what we have to then similarly you are seeing your supraspinatus on your coronal pd without fat suppression sequences so again you look at the biceps tendon so this is your biceps tendon now what you'll start to see will be your supraspinatus so this is your supraspinatus and you can definitely make out this is an increase signal you have gone through a normal anatomy class and you know this is not how the tendon should look like this is at least moderately increased signal so that's why we are going to call it moderate tendinosis and as we saw over here as well as on pd you see some fluid signal over here better appreciated on your fat suppressed sequences so this is your fluid signal over here i'll measure it almost this much on this sequence and if i see this is a partial thickness bursal sided tear involving the supraspinatus <clears throat> now to be very sure more sure about it i'll also see it on my sagittal sequences so this is your supraspinatus we'll keep on tracing the supraspinatus i'll just zoom it up little bit for you guys so a little zoomed up so this is supraspinatus now we are tracing it towards the insertion we are coming forward 
so supra spinatus keep an eye on that so here it becomes little thick and see how this is looking like in supra spinatus as you move further forward this is significantly thickened and as you move forward there is significant thickening and it is also involving a bit of the conjoint tendon so there is supra spinatus as well as little bit of anterior infra spinatus as well so this is all moderate tendinosis and as i approach over here i see this small fluid signal over here which corresponds to almost my mid supra spinatus fibers uh, so there how would you describe it overall there is moderate supra spinatus tendinosis with partial thickness bursal sided supra spinatus tear involving at least 50% of the tendon thickness and you also give a measurement on your ap dimension that how much almost is measuring uh as it would have been discussed why are these important this gives us an idea that how bad the tendon tear is if it is going to go into full thickness or not it gives you a clue on the scan as well so this is how you are looking at your supra spinatus on your coronal weighted images like we looked at we looked at it on our sagittal weighted images as well then let's look at the rest of the rotator cuff tendon so infra spinatus you can see on axials a little bit on coronals as you go back so this would be your infra spinatus but it is best seen on your sagittal and you can make out a lot on your sagittal weighted images so this is infra spinatus which is coming and attaching over here on the greater tuberosity right and this is your teres minor tendon so this is your teres minor which is coming here and attaching over here so teres minor looks normal then i'll move down to subscapularis zooming it up again a little bit for everyone to see so again subscapularis you will look at on your sagittal as well as axial weighted images so the multi pinnate appearance of subscapularis you trace it towards its insertion on the lesser fibrosity and it looks perfectly fine on your sagittal weighted images similarly you try and look on your axial weighted images where again it looks perfectly fine so we have looked at all the rotator cuff tendons and there is what we realized moderate supra spinatus and anterior infra spinatus tendinosus with a small uh supra spinatus bursal sided footprint tear this is all what we have figured out till now so moving on from rotator cuff tendons what you look at is your biceps tendon so this is your biceps tendon over here so you trace it in the entirety it looks fine uh, we have seen the bicipital groove segment now we move on to see the intra articular segment uh, there is a little increased signal in the biceps tendon which looks like on the coronal uh, sagittal weighted images i'll reconfirm my findings on coronal so this is your biceps tendon over here let's see the intra articular segment and you see there is a little increase signal over here in the biceps so there be there is like mild intra articular biceps tendinosis till its biceps labral anchor so this is how we looked at the biceps now we have seen rotator cuff tendons we have seen the biceps tendon from there we move down to look at our articular cartilage and labrum so we will start from superior like i discussed in the last sequence so we start from the superior labrum so superior labrum as such doesn't look really bad it looks fine i'm placing it back and forth it looks fine then moving on to my axial images to look at the anterior and posterior labrum so if you see this labrum is pretty hypo intense and well defined this looks a little ill defined so that is like a fraying kind of a thing is happening because you cannot see a discrete tear as well so there is fraying of the posterior superior labrum then i am going down further and rest of the labrum anterior as well as posterior is looking fine and this is the articular cartilage which is this gray lining which again looks fine nothing major happening and there is no joint effusion so there is not much joint effusion but if you look at there is some subacromial bursal fluid which you can see over here moderate at least subacromial bursal fluid this bright signal in the of the fluid in the subacromial space over here so this is moderate subacromial bursal fluid 
then we move on lastly to look at the acromioclavicular joint so you look at your acromioclavicular joint over here which looks kind of fine nothing major going on over there and to end the study you look at your neurovascular structure so this is your axillary neurovascular bundle and this would be your suprascapular neurovascular bundle this bundle going over here so this bundle going over here is your suprascapular neurovascular bundle so you trace both of them and figure out that there is nothing major going on and lastly or maybe during the evaluation of supraspinatus you look on this image if there is any muscle volume loss or fatty infiltration so kind of everything looks overall fine over here so to conclude this case what all we uh, figured out that is, there is moderate supra and anterior supraspinatus tendinosus and a partial bursal sided supraspinatus tear with moderate subacromial bursal fluid and there was mild intraarticular biceps tendinosus and there was mild posterior superior labral fraying which you see often in elderly patients so you would ignore that and would not uh, lose your sleep over just that finding until unless there are very significant labral signs so this is how we would approach a case just to summarize before moving on to the next case so that uh, everyone sees the next case along with me a little faster so that we can see more cases so you are first seeing any marrow edema or any disproportionate a soft tissue edema then secondly you look at the rotator cuff tendon start with supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minor and lastly subscapularis then you move down to biceps tendon look in the bicipital group and the intraarticular segment moving forward from there you look at the articular cartilage and labrum moving from there you look at the acromioclavicular joint and lastly you look at the neurovascular structures now i believe all of you are uh, well prepared to look at the next case so i'll just scroll this case on this uh, coronal weighted fat suppressed image sorry uh, pd fat suppressed image coronal for you and you can let me know what you're thinking in terms of Uh, i think the chat box would be unable if you want to make it a little interactive kind then i would be happy to see your responses or otherwise i'll take the case forward so scrolling we know this is coracoid process so i am anterior now scrolling backward coming back again so any one of you have you picked up anything till now it looks like a pasta tear ma'am yes very good super so but let's quickly super uh, so i think everybody can talk around in this group so that's perfect i don't need to open the chat box over here so let's quickly see in our systematic step so i'm looking for any marrow edema no i really don't see any marrow edema then i move down to see this is my biceps tendon so my supra is going to start next so this is your supraspinatus and if you see over here you see some fluid signal over here very subtle but you have picked it up brilliantly so this subtle fluid signal over here at the footprint towards the articular side so why i am seeing that i'll open this as well for you so if you see over here you see few intact bursal sided fibers and there are there are uh, tear of the articular sided fibers which are somebody correctly pointed out sorry i can't make out the name over here but then that is something which is called as a uh, pasta lesion or you can even call it partial thickness articular sided footprint supraspinatus tear which means one and the same thing so this is your small footprint there but we will not stop at that we have to look at all these structures so the finding picked up well on this was uh, articular sided partial thickness supraspinatus tear in addition you can see that there is mild tendinosus of the supraspinatus as well in general right and this pasta tear was a little difficult on this section to pick up on your uh, sagittal images but it is very well picked up on your coronal images so you don't have any doubt what you say in addition is that there is mild supraspinatus tendinosus 
Then we move on to look at the infraspinatus, which looks perfectly fine. This is your teres minor, which again looks perfectly fine. Then moving on to look at the subscapularis. So tracing subscapularis back and forth. Showing it to you now on axials as well, which are the two ideal planes one should look at. Do you think subscapularis is normal or anything? Quickly, and yes or no? Yes or no? Atrophy subscapularis. Yes, so there is... If you see, this is your superior part. When I'm coming to this superior part. So in superior part, it looks a little thickened. And as you go inferior, it becomes like a simple tendon. That increased signal is not there. So there is only superior subscapularis, mild tendinosis, but well picked up. Somebody pointed out to atrophy. So to clarify that at this point, if I have to show you atrophy, I would not have zoomed up the image. I have to zoom down the image so that you can see the muscle belly over here. And or, I would move back on my sagittal weighted images to look if there is any muscle atrophy or not. So this is not really a muscle atrophy because there is a little internal rotation and you see how well on axial the muscle bulk looks like. So this is fine. This is not really any muscle atrophy. So we have done, uh, we have seen our all the tendons. Now we see biceps tendon. We focus on biceps tendon, our energy. So, bicipital group segment looks fine. Then I move down and look at the intraarticular segment. So, till here, I'm sorry. So, till here, I see my biceps tendon. And here, if you see from here, is your pulley segment and intraarticular segment. What do you think? Is the uh, biceps tendon normal in the intraarticular segment or what is happening? Showing it to you on coronal as well. Biceps tendon till here, and then this is your intraarticular segment. Do you remember seeing the normal one? How does it look? Similar or different? Quickly, we, we have quite a few pieces to see. See this. Look different. And quickly. So your biceps tendon should normally look hypo intense or dark like this, like you're seeing over here. And if you see here, it looks pretty in, uh, brighter, not dark like this. So that is tendinosis. So there is intraarticular biceps tendinosis, which is happening in this case. So your intraarticular segment is best appreciated on your sagittal weighted images. And you'll be able to pick up that finding. And that's why here you are not able to discreetly appreciate that hypo thing in, in between that segment. But your biceps labral anchor again looks fine. Now moving on to the articular cartilage and labrum quickly. So you guys have to answer looking normal or abnormal. I'm just scrolling. This has little motion. Let's choose the other one. What do you guys think? So I'll tell you, I'm in the superior most section and superior most section we saw over here as well, superior labrum, like I uh, had discussed last time. So I'm able to see superior lab quadrant labrum over here as well, here. And now I'm showing you anterior and posterior labrum over here. What do you see? I'm going towards the inferior. So this is inferior, coming up, coming up, coming up, coming up, coming up, coming up. Superior. Anything? Anybody picked up? Any abnormality or everything looks fine? So in this image, do you uh, see discrete posterior labrum? No, not clear. Not clear. No, you see some hazy things. So this is yes. what I was trying to tell last thing. Most Bingo. cases, posterior labrum looks a little blurred. I don't know. I think maybe we all should get together and do some study on that. But this is little kind of a fraying of the posterior labrum. But overall, rest of the labrum looks fine and okay. So nothing else. Again, articular cartilage looks fine. I don't see any joint effusion. Then I move down to look at the acromioclavicular joint over here. 
which again looks fine. And lastly, my neurovascular structure. So I'll have to zoom out a bit. So to see the axillary neurovascular bundle over here and the suprascapular over here. So all that looks fine. So overall, just to sum up, this is a case of, like you said, predominantly the main finding over here is of pasta lesion. And in addition, you saw intraarticular biceps tendinosis. Moving on to the next case. Now, this is completely your case and you have to tell me for sure that what's happening. So again, scrolling back and forth for you. Anterior, why? You might feel that I'm being repetitive, but uh, usually you guys would be having films and you have to figure out on the film that whether you're looking at something which is anterior or posterior. So this is a big clue for you. You look for coracoid process and then you start moving backwards. So you know you're going from anterior to posterior. Now keep on looking what is happening. Right? I'll scroll you the other image as well. Anterior coracoid process. Moving back. Anybody sees any finding you can speak out loud? It is a massive. Yes, very good. With tendon retraction. I think you guys should can become a radiologist now. Good. So uh, let's see the sagittal images as well. Because on that, you have figured out that it's supraspinatus, but we need to figure out whether infraspinatus is involved or not. So we have to look at the sagittal images. So now you need to tell me that also. What do you think about that? Tendinosis. Is infra also torn or not? I think that becomes a little tricky now. Okay, so no, it's not, not that. Not. It uh, seems okay. Infraspinatus, okay. No, so infraspinatus anterior part is torn. Now let's see how did we approach that. So like you guys clearly said, and it's uh, you were perfectly right. So showing you it on this. So your supraspinatus should insert somewhere over here and you see the tendon lying over here, which is over here. So you usually measure that how much it's retracted. We measure that so that it gives you a, an idea that how bad the tear is, how much it's retracted. Will you be able to pull it back or you need to do a medialized surgery? So all that way you will be guided through this measurement. So this is telling you that supraspinatus is torn. Now we move on to this. So how would you figure out whether infraspinatus is torn alongside or not? So this is your supraspinatus and this is your infraspinatus tendon. Now keep an eye on this one. Now this is merging and forming a conjoint tendon. Yeah, but we have to figure out that almost from this point was infraspinatus by going a section back and forth, right? Now we keep an eye on that image. So it was almost here, right? As I'm going forward, I do not see this bit of infraspinatus coming really well further. I do not see any tissue over here. This is really small bit of infraspinatus which is coming forward and attaching. So a major part of infraspinatus is also gone, right? So we'll show you this again. So this is remaining residual infraspinatus tendon. The tendon bit which should have been over here is not seen. So see this image again. I'm going back once again for you guys. So going back, you do not see any tendon. You do not see any tendon. Still, still, still. And here, almost a little bit of tendon starts to come. So this is your tear of the entire supraspinatus and a major part of infraspinatus. So in addition, when we report this, we give a dimension which is like almost kind of this. So you see a little bit tendon over here, but over this entire AP dimension, you do not see any tendon which is inserting, which is almost 2.4 centimeters. So why do we give this measurement? Because it is going to help you and guide you that how many anchors will you need. As this is a big tear, so you might need two anchors to fix everything back in place. So this dimension gives you an idea that how big surface is missing. 
So, as you all correctly pointed, massive supra and infraspinatus tear. So, in this case, like I pointed out, we give you one this dimension to give you an idea that how bad uh, the tear is and how many anchors do you need. Then, what all additional we need to look at in such a case is second most important thing is to look at the muscle volume loss and fatty infiltration. So, this this is like a moderate to mark muscle volume loss. This entire cup is empty. And you look for infraspinatus also. This is significantly shrunken. And so this is again a marked muscle volume loss of infraspinatus. So your supra and infraspinatus are having significant muscle volume loss. Then on your fat suppressed image, in addition, you look if there are any intraosteocystic changes. Because that will again guide you. Whether you're putting your anchor, if you put your anchor in the interosseous cystic change, chances of having a loosening and anchor displacement are pretty high. So you look if there are any big interosseous cystic changes at the attachment or not. So these are the few important things which you look out. So this case, we know there is supra and infra tear. Quickly moving to look at the teres minor, which looks fine. And then moving to look at the subscapularis. So let's go and have a look up at the subscapularis over here as well as here. So I'll zoom it up for you again. It's I'm sorry. So zooming it up again for you guys. And you guys have to tell me what do you think about the subscap as well. It's a pretty nice case, actually. Yeah, How bad is the tear? Subscap tear with the dislocated bicep tendon. Yes, very good. So that's kind of complete, but it's not still a full thickness subscap tear. You might need to manage it like that, although. So if you see on your sagittal weighted images, this is your multi pinnate subscap. And as you come towards its insertion, there are these superficial fibers which are coming and inserting, but there are no deep fibers. So this is like a partial thickness, deep subscapularis tear. So again, I'll show it to you on actions. So these are the superficial fibers which are going across and attaching, uh, but the deep fibers are completely torn. And this bright thing which you are seeing over here, this is your biceps tendon. So this is your biceps tendon. Trace it up, up, up. And it is here, it has become increased, it is getting degenerated. So this bright stuff is your biceps tendon. Keep an eye on that bright thing. You can see that bright thing moving over here. Over here it has come. And now it is going into the intra-articular region. So your biceps is medially dislocated or subluxated. Deep and in the deep supra, deep to the supra uh, subscapularis. And your subscapularis, there is high grade undersurface tear with few intact uh, superficial or maybe bursal sided fibers. So, your uh, nice case to show you, a very good case showing the subluxation. So, we have covered the rotator cuff. Now, quickly, we have to biceps also, we looked at it simultaneously. Now, quickly having a look at articular cartilage and labrum. I'm just not missing steps in every case because that gives us an approach how to go for a case and we don't miss things. Although in this case, I think nothing else would matter because uh, you know what you're dealing with predominantly. Uh, but still, there are certain findings. If, is there rotator cuff arthropathy? Also, you would like to know in such a case. So let's see the labrum and articular cartilage. So your superior labrum doesn't look really bad. Then what do you think is happening to rest of the labrum? Rest of the labrum fine or any abnormality? And also tell me about the articular cartilage. Articular cartilage. Yes, articular cartilage. Uh, some hyper intermediate single intensity. Where? I'll show it on the other as well. So this is a little difficult zone with shoulder, but grossly it's normal. 
So if you see this bright line over here, here, and similarly this grey thing over here and here, centrally the cartilage is little thin. So otherwise this cartilage looks pretty fine over here and here. Cartilage, grey line, doesn't look really bad, right? But if you see the labrum carefully, let's start again from up. So anterior superior, posterior superior looks okay as I keep on coming down. But if you see this labrum in the anterior and inferior quadrant, there is signal within the labrum as well. So going further down, you see a lot of signal within the labrum as well. So this anterior inferior quadrant labrum is definitely gone. So there is anterior inferior labral tear and there is glenoid osseous remodeling. So can you see this extra bony growth kind of thing is happening? So because of uh, changes in dynamics of movement and everything, there are certain changes and there is anterior inferior labral tear which we can see. So this is a nice case to show you that how you can see the signal within the labrum over here to pick that up. So this is the region where you should see labrum and you see this increased signal uh, area within over here. So there was an associated anterior inferior labral tear. There is mild joint effusion if at all. And lastly to see, your acromioclavicular joint doesn't look really bad. And uh, neurovascular structures were fine. So I'm bypassing that so that we can cover more cases. So to sum up what all findings are there, supra infraspinatus full thickness tear, high grade undersurface subscapularis tear with medial subluxation of biceps and anterior inferior labral tear. Then moving on to this next case. So now again, you guys have to tell me that what is going on in this patient. We'll start from anterior, always showing you the coracoid process. I think you remember nothing, but I think you will remember this coracoid process because I've been so repetitive. So let's go back and you guys tell me what's going on. Do you see any marrow edema or not? Is the first question we always ask. Yes. Where is the marrow edema? Uh, posterior. Posterior? posterior. Yes. Which, which bone? Humeral head. Yes. Posterior humeral head marrow edema. You mean to say this area? Yes. So let me show you that area on some other sequence. Yes, you are true. You picked up the finding right. There is marrow edema. So when you see posterior superior humeral head marrow edema, what should you think about? Hill such lesion, ma'am. Yes, very good. Brilliant. So let's go and see is there a hill sacs lesion or not. So your hill sacs lesion, if you it is difficult to appreciate on coronal and that's perfectly fine. So what we use is our, we pick up the marrow edema on this coronal image. If axials are available, then on axials. And then we move down to our uh, axial images and sagittal images to look at the size of hill sacs lesion. So this is your hill sacs lesion over here. we need to give a size. So if I put, so this is approximately this much on axial images and approximately this much size on my sagittal images. So this is the size and by this much amount, I'm sorry. And there is a very minimal depression by approximately 0 0.3 centimeter. So you know you have picked up hill sacs lesion. Uh, that is the first thing you figured out within the bone. So you pick, uh, looking at the marrow edema, you picked out something. And now you know you're looking at a case of which is anterior instability. But I never change my path. I go through the same path to see all the findings. And I compile things in the impression. So I'll follow my routine path. Because I saw a bony abnormality, I measured and mentioned about it. But then I go back to my rotator cuff tendons. Oh God.
Okay, we'll ignore that line for now. So we look at our rotator cuff tendon. What do you think about rotator cuff tendons? It looks like tendinosis, ma'am. Just kill ah. here. So which which tendon? I'm showing you all four in one go. We have just one second for them. Which tendon? So I'm showing you this back and forth sagittal, so you can correctly tend neither tendon. Supra and inter infra. So mainly supra. So this is your supra. This is your infra tendon. You trace them on sagittal weighted images. This is your infra pura, and this is your increased signal. So this is an increased signal in the supraspinatus. Now, if this would be a young patient, like twenty years, I'll not go down and call this as tendinosis. I would still think in terms maybe because this dislocation has happened, so there might be a little stretch or something, and this might just be a contusion, right? So we leave it at that point. Rest of all the tendons look fine. So biceps tendon also, I want you to see quickly on this, and here is your biceps tendon intraarticular segment, and uh, agree with me, it was fine. So what is more important? We go down and look at that. So let's move on to look at our labrum. And now you, are going, you guys are going to tell me that what is happening to the labrum. So this is the superior yeah. section. Let me scroll through first fully and then you answer. So this is your superior section. And the, now I'll scroll from top. So this is my superior section on axial. Now I'm going down. So, what labrum do you think is torn? So, commonly, which labrum should be affected? Intro inferior. Perfect. So let's start with that. So, what do you guys think that is? You can see this discrete labrum lying here, and there is a deep fluid cleft over here, right? Yes. I keep on going up. Tell me when you see the normal labrum. Did you see the normal labrum? No. No. Okay. So till the superior most section, you never saw the normal labrum. Okay. I then come back here and see my superior labrum. Do you do you think superior labrum looks normal? No. No, there is increased signal for sure. Mm -hmm. And yes. it looks such a tiny bit, which is not the normal size of the labrum over there. And there is this increased signal. So we don't think superior is also normal. Okay, then we move down and focus on energy and posterior labrum. What do you think is happening to the posterior labrum? Is it looking normal? Posterior superior. Normal or abnormal? Guys, please, normal or abnormal is not that difficult. Anyone can choose randomly. Abnormal. Abnormal. You don't see a triangle black, so definitely abnormal. Abnormal. Tell me when you start to see a normal. Mm, no. Yes. 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 So normal. So this is in the posterior inferior cord. I'll keep on going down for you guys. Can you see normal posterior inferior now? Yes. 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 Inferior thing. Inferior also you see over here. So only posterior inferior and inferior labrum is spared. This is entire anterior labrum tear extending past the superior labrum up to the posterior superior labrum. That is up to the posterior equator. Entire labrum is torn, right? So this is how you go and look at it. And you guys did it beautifully, I would say. Uh, then we look at the articular cartilage. So we have seen at the lab, we had a look at the labrum. Now what we need to do, have a look at is the articular cartilage. What do you think is happening to the articular cartilage? Is it normal or abnormal? Oh. Overall, it's okay. It's a very subtle. Looks condition. normal. Yes. No. But if you see in this section, this little bit of labrum, this might, this small labrum is uh, articular cartilage is missing. How you identify that also, I'll show you. Can you see the articular cartilage is extending up to this rim over here? Can you yes. see that? But if I come a section down, it is not extending till this rim. So okay. this small articular cartilage is missing. But if you don't pick that up, it's fine. But we should not miss that for sure. So this is how a small chondral defect, uh, chondral injury is also there. Uh, 
so there is a very small cartilage defect otherwise rest of the cartilage looks fine uh, then we move quickly what is i'm so sorry for that let's pull it over here oh, the margin can go we look at the inferior glenohumeral ligament also once because that is commonly injured alongside so if you see there is a little edema at its humeral as well as glenoid attachment so there is little low grade kind of a stretch injury which is happening to the inferior glenohumeral ligament as well but that is not going to change the management but still just to show you as a finding okay so overall you all know that you are dealing with a case of anterior instability uh you have picked up the lab uh, labral changes and the humeral side changes now what is remaining is to look at the bone loss so what you need to do is you need to go on this section which is almost at the articular so in this i am not getting those lines across but you take things when your line is corresponding almost through this area so when your sagittal images pass through this area at that point you take the bone and you draw a circle so this is not the software which we usually use but this is just for our teaching software so that's how the things are getting little yeah perfect so i draw a eclipse so you draw a circle over here and you draw best fit circle which includes the inferior and the posterior inferior quadrant and then you draw a line through the center of the circle representing the diameter and then you measure that how much of the bone is missing so almost this much bone out of uh, so it will be like 0.5 out of 3.1 is missing so 0.5 divided by 3.1 into 100 will give you a percentage of bone loss so we use this method only commonly to measure the bone loss and that will give you an approximate idea so i don't think it should be really significant but obviously we can go ahead and do our calculations and figure out that how much is the bone loss so this is how you need to approach your entire instability case moving on to the next case oh uh again an interesting case let me know what do you think i'll just scroll on the images for you for a quick process i am anterior heading back what do you see any abnormality some diffuse muscular edema in the deltoid ma'am very good so that is so you see disproportionate lot of muscle edema let me show you this on sag now you need to figure out where it is center right so now we we'll, let's try and figure out where this so much edema where is it center anterior posterior superior are your options anterior superior posterior or options i have given you options you need to choose one thing anterior yes <laughs> i think that's not difficult there is so much anterior edema right so anterior superior posterior means if i have to choose i'll definitely go for anterior superior and posterior looks relatively fine so i need to see this area carefully but before coming on to this area let me quickly have a look at my supraspinatus what is your opinion about the supraspinatus let me show you the pd also it's loading it's not loading here anyway ha it loaded So, what is your opinion about supraspinatus? Quick, quick, Baba. Standard. 
Yes, there is at least mild supra as well as infraspinatus tendinosus. I agree with you. Can you see that increased gray signal on PD? Sometimes this might be confusing, but here also you see a little increased signal over here. So you see overall a little increased signal, but if you try and notice this, a lot of edema is not centered around supraspinatus or infraspinatus, right? Because you picked up that this is anterior. So your supra and infraspinatus are looking fine. Your teeth minor is looking fine. Now let's move down and look at the anterior structures, which are our biceps tendon and subscapularis and even deltoid, which showed so much edema. So now you're trying to look at where is, this is, as you correctly said, anterior deltoid has a lot of edema. I agree. Whenever you see dis, uh, disproportionate edema in these soft tissues, what should you think of? Two common things that should strike your mind. Axillary nerve injury, ma'am. Do nervous. No, so this is this, this patient doesn't have any injury. Patient says that I just uh, had a, I was just just tried to lift something up and I suddenly had severe pain, unbearable pain. So don't think about trauma. There is no trauma. There is no real trauma to cause a significant injury. infection. Infection, infection. Okay, you have a lot of edema and infection. Any other thing? With infection, if you see only soft tissue edema, you are not seeing anything around the joint. So it's not a septic arthritis. If you see infection and subcutaneous or sorry, a muscle edema, you are mainly thinking if there is some abscess and surrounding which you see a lot of edema, but I don't see any collection or an abscess, right? I see a lot of, this is joint diffusion. So don't confuse. This is subscapularis rhesus. Except that there is just this diffuse edema in deltoid, in subscapularis, there is edema. And this lot of intermuscular plane fluid is there. Subacromial vessel fluid is there. What else you think when you see a lot of edema? We had discussed. If not me, anybody else would have definitely discussed. So I'll tell you two common things you should... Okay, okay, somebody was trying to say something. Muscle, it is a sprain or internal right. degloving. So that's it. Uh, so if you're talking about... Um, degloving or something, I say there is not a significant trauma. So in fact, uh, you would be telling me, no, I don't think it's a significant trauma to have that kind of a picture. So you would be helping me out to rule in real life. What else? So always remember two things, calcific tendinosis or tendinitis is the most common cause. And the second thing is if there is some old trauma, there might be myositis or something. Right? Yes. But around shoulder, calcific tendinitis is pretty, pretty common. And now if you carefully look at this thing overlying here is your calcium blob. This thing overlying here is your calcium blob in subscapularis. So you have calcium blobs. These are something extra. Right? I'll help you see it on your sagittal radiative images also. So this is your normal subscapularis tendon. Do you all agree? Let's see on PD. I love PDs. So this is your normal subscapularis tendon. This is coming over here. And you see this thing is extra over here. This tiny thing is extra. And then you see this is again something extra. So these are your soft calciums. And <coughs> the calcium, there is so much edema. So this is a case of calcific subscapularis tendinosis. So, clinically, you have sudden severe pain. You also think of calcific, right? So, this was a case predominantly to show you calcific tendinosis and to highlight the importance of disproportionate edema. Moving on to the next case, again, you guys pick up what you see. I'll give you helpful sequences over here. So I am now guiding you. Uh, rest all findings are almost okay. So I'm trying to guide you and get through the right area. And now you need to tell me what we are dealing with. Patient glenoid. present. Sorry. Glenoid. Glenoid what? Sorry, I missed. I just heard glenoid. Did you say something in addition to glenoid? I don't know. Oh, no. Is it a slap, please? Slap. Yes, there is a, a labral tear. Completely agreed. You picked up it perfectly fine. So there is biceps labral junction fraying. 
<laughs> we'll see it on agiles also. So this patient history is also important. Patient has pre patient has presented with restriction of moments and pain. So as you said, there was super, uh, superior labral sprain, and it, uh, in addition, if you see here, there is posterior superior labral sprain also. So and uh, so this is this can fit into one of your types of slab. That's okay, but that's not the cause of symptoms here. Patient has presented with restricted movements. It's not labral signs which are bothering the patient. Restricted movements and uh, pain. So I try to look for supraspinatus. It looks pretty fine. I'll show it to you on SAGE also. It looks kind of fine. Infraspinatus looks fine. This little increased signal is because it's fat sat and little obliquely done scan. I'll show you subscapularis care quickly. So subscapularis also looks fine. Labrum and articular cartilage we discussed. So what else you should look for? Rotator cuff looks fine. Rotator, rotator or adhesive capsule. Very good. Very nicely picked up. So you see this rotator interval edema. <laughs> and then you look for, let me window it to a little better, anterior inferior capsular thickening. And so when everything is normal and you have history of restricted movements, you have to think about it. And you see this is pretty subtle and not very significant. It's early stage. And you see the anterior inferior little bit of edema as well. In this case, you we are lucky to have this fat suppressed to show you guys. Although we are so used to seeing it, we don't need these. So you see this edema along the anterior inferior capsule this edema along the anterior anterior capsule and this rotator interval scarring and edema. So this was a case of adhesive capsulitis. Right? Nothing else pointed to patient symptoms and you see findings of adhesive capsulitis. Moving on to the next case. Again, you guys are going to take charge. Tell me what do you see? Hagel, ma'am. Anterior. This is anterior. I'm going back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of joint effusion and a lot of joint effusion. effusion. But before joint effusion, what do you need to see on this sequence? Bone edema and the anterior bone imperial edema. face of so do you see any bone edema? Yeah. Humerus. Yes, you see mm -hmm. it in whether it's anterior or posterior. Anterior inferior. Anterior. So anterior bone edema not often seen. What could be the cause for anterior bone edema? Posterior is very good. So you once you pick up one finding, then you know what you need to look for next. So this is anterior bone edema. You are most likely looking at a case of posterior instability and there is a lot of joint effusion. So we'll directly move on. I'm not showing you tendons because they were perfectly fine. What I want you to see is the labrum. So now, the again, the ball is completely in your court to judge what is happening to the labrum. And whatever you will say, I'll agree. So let me tell you, let me tell you which quadrants. So superior labrum. Mm -hmm. I'll help you because it's a little subtle. So if you see carefully, there is little increased signal over here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So superior, but let's see rest on this. So I'll go to the superior most section. This is the superior. I'm going down. So, because it is posterior instability, which labrum you are focusing mainly on? Posterior. So let's first see posterior because we know posterior is more concerned. Mm -hmm. So, let's look at the posterior labrum and you guys tell me what is happening. So, now we'll start with posterior superior cord. Mm -hmm. Abnormal. Abnormal. What do you think? There's a crease. Posterior superior. Mm -hmm. This is posterior superior, posterior superior. Now no. we are entering posterior inferior. Do you see any normal labrum in the posterior sections? No. No. 
exactly it's completely torn a little bit is lying over here as well if i go inferior you see the labrum is torn and lying like this hmm. not if i trace that up back again i don't see any labrum in the entire posterior quadrant as you all guys also picked up and then your superior labrum shows a little signal over here then i move on to see the anterior labrum what do you think about the anterior labrum mm stone to sorry sub normal in the middle part yes so anterior labrum doesn't look really bad you can see almost the entire anterior labrum pretty well so it's predominantly a tear of entire posterior labrum with your reverse hillsack lesion over here and the best part is you can see your labrum floating in here like this so this was seen pretty well on this as well so see this is your floating labrum torn and floating in your joint effusion and you see a lot of joint effusion as well somebody i just overheard in the beginning just pointed out that there is glenohumeral ligament injury inferior no so if you see this is just a stretched out ligament because of joint effusion otherwise you do not see any thickening or edema within the ligament itself right so that's not the case over here so i think with that i almost sum up all the cases just give me a second i need to put on the back charging up for that so uh, what till then whatever doubts you have uh, you can point out to what you didn't understand where exactly to what is your uh, uh, landmark to see suprascapular neurovascular structure ma'am okay i'll just just give you a second just done yes so let me tell you how uh, so good question uh, so how do i pick that up is to look at the suprascapular notch so this is my almost midline section so this is my suprascapular notch and this bright thing which you can see over here is my suprascapular neurovascular bundle so similarly on my axials this defect in the glenoid is your suprascapular notch and these structures which are passing over here once i go back and forth will be your suprascapular neurovascular bundle and then this is your spine of scapula and this is your glenoid and this notch is your spino glenoid notch and again the contents these are your suprascapular neurovascular bundle so you can do a simple way you identify glenoid you identify spine of scapula and then use whatever you see in that is your suprascapular neurovascular bundle go back and forth and trace it Done. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Anything else? I just have taken out one case of scapulothoracic bursitis because somebody wanted me to show that. So I'll just share that one last case. Let me just open it. So that's not a very often indication which we face around in our practice. but sometimes there is localized tenderness in that area specifically and we get a request for look at the scapulothoracic region uh, carefully so let me uh, share the screen now okay i hope you all can see my screen so this is sometimes a very subtle thing to be picked up on a scan so this is your spine of scapula and what we really follow in such case is a pain marker and what you see in this case is this subtle edema i don't know if you can see this subtle bright signal over here it almost got this is your pain marker this is your ribs this is your spine of scapula and this is that subtle signal within the bursa at the almost level of pain marker uh, why i am saying that is edema because if you see up there is no edema there is no edema as you keep on coming down you start to see the subtle edema and it corresponds to the site of pain marker and it again goes there is no edema so this is was a case of subtle scapulothoracic bursitis uh you just need to do large fov images so that you cover the entire scapula and the rib cage over there and you can see anything which is causing 
friction over there. This is aluminum. Anything else now, you guys? Uh, hopefully, I believe the session was helpful, and you guys were answering right really nicely. So I think you have got to know a lot. You. How to see the rotator interval on coronal sections, ma'am? Okay, I'll, I'll now uh, I'll share my horrors because I can show you correlation. So let's see, this patient has, has sagittal images. So we all know that biceps tendon is a content of rotator interval. So as a radiologist, I need to don't, don't need to bother about it. I just double click over here on sagittal in the rotator interval and I get to know where the rotator interval is. But if you are doing it on the films, so once you see the coracoid process and you see any fatty space next to it or just posterior to it. So this is your anterior most coracoid process. And as you're going back, what fatty space you start to see would be your rotator interval and biceps tendon also you see within it, this way. So this space, once you start to see posterior to the coracoid process will be your rotator interval. And if you're doing it in on dicom data, then it's not a problem. You just correlate things. Okay. Ma'am, isolated GT edema without history of any fall in a sports person, what, what would be the thing, anterior GT edema? So, see, the GT edema, what, how we approach and look at it. So, if you see really anterior humeral edema, Without knowing the history, I'm right now telling you, without knowing the history, so a lot of anterior, then I'm thinking in terms of posterior instability. If I see posterior superior humeral edema, then I'm thinking of anterior instability. And if I see proper central almost GT edema, then I'm looking at most likely impactional injuries. Like if you may not see a fracture line all the time, but it might be just an impactional injury, which is the usual case. I have not often seen stress in this region. Okay, thank I you. That answers your question. Thank you, ma'am. Anything else? Can we differentiate uh, teres minor from infraspinatus and coron coronal images, ma'am? Or it will be is difficult. I think you should not rely on coronals for that. You should use your sagittals and axials. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, I think that sums up things. Uh, I'm also there on that group which has been created on WhatsApp. So, I um, I hope overall the entire shoulder course would have helped you guys. Um, okay, then hope to see you for another course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank Thank you, man. Thank you. We should you make a, a knee or hip one too. Thank uh -huh. you. Hopefully, we'll make those courses soon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much.